Uh, thank you for this time to gather around your word. We ask your Holy Spirit to teach us. In Christ's name, amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, we'll be looking at Philippians chapter <coughs> 3. I don't have <coughs> any uh, slides. <coughs> We're kind of old school this morning because I just didn't land on where to preach from till kind of late. I was struggling on where to preach from, and a couple of guys visited me from Gideon's to pray for uh, the church, and they asked me what I was going to preach on this Sunday when I told them I was going to preach, and I kind of stumbled around because I was thinking about the passage in Hebrews and the passage in Colossians, and I just said Philippians chapter 3. I don't know exactly why I said it. I know it's been on my heart, so uh, I, I took that as a sign, and that's where I'm preaching from, Philippians chapter 3. Is our spiritual growth God's job or is it our job? The Bible says yes. Sp spiritual growth is ultimately and always the work of God, but we play a role in our spiritual growth. How do Christians grow spiritually? If, if God desires for us to grow spiritually and God causes spiritual growth, then how are we to respond in order to experience that spiritual growth? This morning I want to look at Paul, the Apostle Paul's example. Uh, in fact, he invited believers to look at his example. He says, brothers, join in imitating me. As, I, as he lived out following Christ, they were to imitate him. So Paul's example is extremely helpful, and since it is Scripture, it's completely authoritative. Now, a warning, when you look at Paul's example of discipleship, you look at his example of spiritual growth, it's a little intense. <laughs> it's not a cakewalk. It's more like a gritty battle. It's like Paul's like those uh, infantrymen at Iwo, Iwo Jima. He's constantly trying to plant the lordship of Christ and his glory in the middle of his life. And so, just a warning, there's some intensity here. If you're going to follow Christ, be ready for that. If you're going to follow Paul, be ready for that, or for Christ. Look at Philippians chapter 3. Paul shares the secrets of the spiritual growth. I'm going to focus on 12 through 16, but I did want to read 7 and 4 because it will help. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of, from God that depends on faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have obtained. What can we learn about spiritual growth from the Apostle Paul? What is our role in spiritual growth? And a few things pop out at me, only a few that I have time to talk about, and one is desire. Paul had a strong desire to know Christ and to be more like Christ. Christ. He says, surpassing worth of knowing Christ, that I may gain Christ, that I may know him. Well, Paul already knew Christ, so this, is, this has to do with knowing him more. And this morning, you'll hear this a lot, the, our position and our condition, they're attached, but they're not exactly the same. Paul's position is he knew Christ. Christ knew, knew him. But Paul's condition was striving to be more conformed to Christ than he hadn't arrived. You have a position in Christ and you have a condition. He says even sharing his suffering, even becoming like him in his death. That's how radically Paul wants to be like 
Christ. There was this uh, man in the psychiatric hospital who thought he was Christ, and they couldn't disabuse him of this notion despite all the therapy. So finally, one of the staff members had him stand up and measured him with measuring tape and had him extend his arms and measured that. And then he got ready to leave the room. The man said, what are you doing? He said, I, I, you said you're Christ. I've got some wood and some nails out here I'm going to go get. I'm not Christ. I'm not Christ. He said, do you desire spiritual growth? How much do you desire spiritual growth? Sometimes I desire something, but not really strongly, right? I don't really want to exercise regularly. But I do want to want to exercise regularly. Do, do you desire to grow, but it's not real strong? Well, repent of apathy, and it's God who works in you to both will and work his good pleasure. So as you're waiting on him to build that desire, then repent and be in fellowship and be in the word and be in believing prayer. Now, if you don't desire spiritual growth, well, that's a problem. Uh, Matthew Henry said, wherever there is true grace, there is desire for more grace. Paul says, don't be drunk on wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. He wants us to be godaholics. The Holy Spirit is addictive. And so, the Spirit, the evidence that you have the Spirit is you want more of Him. You want more of Christ. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now we learn more in verse 12 about Paul's desire. Not that I've obtained this. That word this does not appear in the Greek. He just simply says, not that I've obtained. It's like, I guess like saying, not that I have arrived. What has Paul not arrived at? What has he not obtained? The next phrase helps a little bit, or am already perfect. Paul has not yet reached perfection. He's trying to combat kind of a false notion. People would twist his words or see his life for me to live as Christ, those sort of things, and think, well, Paul's entered into a rarefied air. He's really, you know, virtually free of sin. And that's been a, doc a false doctrine that's popped up in church history, perfectionism, that you can live, at least for periods, virtually free of sin, uh, because that's what it means to leave the corruption and become part of Christ. And Paul's combating the notion that that's what it means to be in Christ. And kind of reminds me of health and wealth churches where... Uh, you have, can have perfect wealth and perfect health and success if you have enough faith. I know people who go to those churches who have had corrective surgery of their eyes or wear contact lens because they don't want to wear glasses and admit that their vision is not perfect. Well, when will Paul be perfect? Well, verse 11 implies at the resurrection. Is that the resurrection is when we will have new bodies, we'll be complete, nothing lacking, sin is gone at the point of death and resurrection? When Paul would arrive at total completeness. But he says, I press on to make it my own. Why does Paul strive for something he can't achieve in this life? I mean, anyone can die. <laughs> That's not, the, that's not a kind of goal to strive for. Paul's speaking of the power combo of living to magnify and maximize the glory of Christ and then dying and receiving completion. That power combo is so important. Our goal is not to die and become perfect, but to be perfected so when we die, we're made complete. You know, there's a huge difference between a uh, football team going to the locker room at the end of the game, having won a well-fought victory, and a team going to the locker room at the end of the game having experienced a dismal effort and dismal defeat. There's a big difference. The shower feels the same. You know, you're relieved. But there's more joy in the, victor the victory. Romans 8 says we are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. We're being, we're being in the process, we're being uh, conformed now, and we will, that will be completed at the resurrection of Christ. He says in verse 12, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. He says, I haven't obtained it, but I have been obtained. <laughs> Christ 
abducted me, he obtained me from death, from spiritual rebellion on the road to Damascus and placed me in his eternal kingdom. And so Paul is eternally going to honor and glorify his Lord. I have, I have been obtained by Christ. I, I was, he's obtained me. That's Paul's position. But I haven't yet obtained it or perfection. That's a statement about Paul's condition. It's closing in on being conformed to Christ, but it hasn't arrived. Again, what is Paul pressing toward? What is he trying to make his own? This completeness, a dedicated life that maximally glorifies Christ, and then at the resurrection, receives a crown, victory. You know, the Bible, that verse says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Hidden in that verse is the God's vision for you. It's the glory of God. We were created to be vessels of his glory. And so no wonder it's such a tragedy that all have fallen short of his glory. No wonder the consequences are so devastating that all have fallen short we were created, and our highest joy is to be vessels of his glory. You know, we think sometimes as Christians, God is just there pointing out my sin, and condemning me. But the heart of God, the investment of God, is to redeem us from sin to make us be his outlets of glory. And all we do, we're to glorify him. Paul presses on to be more conformed to Christ. Do you desire to grow? And then the, another thing that leaps out at me in these words is exertion. Paul exerts himself in this whole thing, or maybe intensity. He exerts himself in faith and in faithful actions, right? Faithful actions go with faith. Jesus said, blessed are if you do these things. In verse 13, he repeats his disclaimer his disclaimer is, I do not consider that I have made it my own. He has to keep saying this. Do you think there were people in the church who thought they had arrived or thought Paul had arrived or were coasting big time? But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. What, lie, what lay behind Paul? Well, his pre-conversion life, but I think he's speaking to Christians about their Christian life. So it's also their Christian attainments and past obedience, and past growth. To, to be exerting, you can't be looking backwards. That word, a straining forward, is a strong athletic word. It, it, it's a picture of an athlete. It has double prepositions packed into it. It's a picture of an athlete's muscles and lungs straining at full might as he crosses the finish line. Can you imagine the athlete stepping up to the starting blocks, and before the race begins, as they're warming up, he says to his fellow runners, you know, I've had some great races. I've won so many races and talked about his exploits. That's a runner who's not ready for the race. Sometimes we get nostalgic and we say, it's just not the way it used to be. I remember the good old days. That's not really the mindset of a runner. And that's recreational activity. It won't win the race, looking backwards. Spiritual maturity requires that we not focus on our past, but on the obedience ahead. What Paul is combating is the notion that we've arrived, and he's combating complacency and apathy and the idea that we can coast. Someone said comfort zones are nice, but nothing ever grows there. He exerts himself in this faith calling. He pursues, he chases conformity to Christ. Your spiritual growth can require some exertion of faith. At the foot of one of the mountains in the Alps is a grave of a man who tried to climb to the pinnacle and fell off a precipice, and it simply has his name, and then it says he died climbing. That's not a bad epitaph for believers. He says in verse 14, I press on toward the goal. For the prize of the upper call of God in Christ. He exerts and he presses on. He pushes for maximum glory requires maximum obedience and effort. Now, this is not self-improvement. This is not self-improvement. This is being conformed to Christ. 
This is a strenuous availability to Christ. It's seeking to be conformed to Christ by faith and by obedience. Obedience comes with faith, right? The Bible says that the righteousness of God is revealed from heaven, and it is from faith to faith. It's from faith by faith from first to last. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. It's not a point system because it's all by faith. Look what Paul says in verse 9, to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Well, Paul, why are you seeking that? You already have that. You're already righteous. You already know Christ. Why do you keep saying, I want to know Christ? Well, positionally, he knows Christ. But his condition is one of seeking more of Christ. He's straining to believe and to repent and to know Christ more. Let me ask you, is there any strain or exertion in your spiritual growth, your pursuit of Christ, or are you coasting? A little boy fell out of bed and was crying. His mother came to comfort him, and she asked, what happened? He said, I guess I, I guess I went to sleep too close to where I got in. Maybe you didn't start coasting at the beginning. Maybe, well, when did you start coasting? That doesn't honor Christ. We may have some repenting to do. Lord, give me that stronger desire to be conformed to Christ progressively. And teach me how to exert myself to believe you, to repent, and to be conformed. He says, i pressing toward the goal. What, what is the goal, the pride? Upward call Christ. Now, that's an athletic metaphor also. The winner of the race would be called up to the judge's podium. It's an upward call, and there he would receive his prize. So he's talking about the resurrection, really. He's talking about being, being called up and being made complete, and their rewards as well. But it's a lifelong call, really, right? The athlete doesn't wait for the call of the judge to go up to the top stand. He's thinking of that call for years in his training. Upward calls throughout our life. This is the call that we would maximally glorify Christ. You know, the, again, to head to the locker rooms. After a well-fought victory is a different experience, a different level of comfort and joy than to head to the locker rooms with a so-so or poor performance. This lady, Frances Chadwick, she was the first woman to swim the English Channel both directions. She was trying to swim in California uh, from the Catalina Island to California, and the Pacific Pacific's very cold. That was one obstacle, and also a deep fog settled. And she couldn't see anything. She finally gave up after 15 hours, just a half hour or half mile from the coast. And she told the reporters, I'm not making excuses, but if it hadn't been for the fog, if I could have seen the land, I would have made it. And she repeated it, the same performance several weeks later, same type of fog, but she made it. In fact, she broke the record, even the men's record, by two hours because she had in mind, there is land there. That's the hope of glory. That, the Bible says this hope purifies us. This hope is set before us. We're to hold fast to this hope, waiting for our blessed hope. Exertion focuses on the prize. That's not about our position in Christ. It's about our condition. And that's something I hadn't really figured out theologically. How... Our condition converges with our position. That's all a mystery. Only God knows how that exactly converges. Jesus told his disciples, you're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. You're already clean. That's their position. Abide in me. I will abide in you. That's their condition. That relates to their condition. Well, the, the third thing that kind of sticks out to me, especially in verse 16, is endurance. To grow in Christ, you have to have endurance. What kind of endurance? Theological endurance. You don't start scrapping truth of the Bible because of how you feel. And it's ethical and moral endurance. You don't start 
dishonoring Christ in your actions because of pressure and how you feel. You repent when you sin. He who calls you as faithful will be faithful. Verse 16, only let us hold true to what we have attained. That word hold true is literally a word to march behind and walk in accordance with the military term. He's saying, hold true to what? What you have attained. That's strange. In verse 12, he says that Paul says, I have definitely not attained something. But in verse 16, he says, virtually all Christians have attained something. And we don't know exactly what he means. Most commentaries, almost all commentaries and commentators say, well, this is just their point of maturity. And it makes sense that as you strain to grow in Christ, don't forget the path you were on. Don't digress. Don't forget the pace you were on, the level of maturity you had. But it, it seems like you maybe that, that view can kind of contradict what he says in verse 13 forgetting what lies behind straining for what lies ahead so the commentators have a little bit of a contradiction here why is paul saying in one verse forget what your past attainments and then in verse 16 he's saying well live according to walk in line with your past attainment of maturity so what else could paul mean here i think he could mean our position what have all of us attained the righteousness of Christ, or actually has been obtained for us, right? We've been obtained. We've been abducted from darkness, from eternal death through Christ. We aren't waiting until the end to have this position. We have righteousness of Christ. Positionally and in title, indeed, we are in Christ, but our condition varies according to faith. Whereas Paul says here is, only let us walk in line with that position we have that's the, what we're to keep in mind that is what guides our condition in ephesians he says about the royal high position of sons of god i urge you to live a life worthy of the call you have received the call you have received is their position living a life worthy is their condition it relates to their condition our condition to reflect our position paul says his condition is not yet perfection it's not complete conformity to christ he still has sin he still has to beat his body and make it obedient to christ but his position his position is secure position is a gift the condition is rewarded both both are by faith righteousness is by faith from first to last the whole thing too many christians are satisfied with their position and the New Testament just shouting at us to pay attention to your condition in light of your position. Live a life worthy. That word worthy, you get our word axiomatic, axiomatic from. It means lined up with. It's fitting. It doesn't make a joke of. It fits. Live a life that fits where we're heading, what we're going to be when we're complete in Christ care deeply about your condition it's god who saves our job is to paul says in philippians to work out our salvation that means live out our salvation like mixing a salad make sure that your justification your city of the christ make sure that gets mixed into your life work out your salvation live out what christ has done and is doing and will do when you see him Hebrews says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Run with endurance, Hebrews 12 says. You might say, well, if I could endure, if I could just endure, I'd be more mature. But actually, you become more mature by enduring. That's working out your salvation with fear and trembling. When was the last time you had some fear and trembling about working out what God's done for you? Endure to the end. Keep repenting. Keep working into your life. Salvation of God. Don't quit. Don't coast. Have some strength. Don't congratulate yourself on running three laps in a four-lap race. 
finish strong to the end.